Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of the new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so that you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Bug out bags for the zombie apocalypse, drilling a headphone jack with the iPhone, and power your phone with a 9-volt. Live from the Twit Eastside Studio in beautiful Petaluma, it's the new screensavers. <laughs> Savers. This is episode 122, recorded September 16th, 2017. I am Father Robert Palliser. And I'm Patrick Norton. And Patrick, we've got a crazy crowd in studio today. These are students from down under from the Doncaster Secondary College in Melbourne. Uh, you gotta, you gotta announce yourself. Say hello. This is the world. Yeah. Come on, Aussies. This is the Represent. politest group of Australians I've ever been in a room with, possibly because all of the other Australians I know were rugby players. I know. Yes. You can yes. get loud. Yeah. Do you have any school enthusiasm whatsoever? Not really. How about science? Do you love science? Yeah. Uh, okay. Wait. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> Are you excited to go Yankees to Disneyland? Cat. We're not talking about this. There, there we, we go. go. Let's see, we got to find the secret. Uh, Patrick, it's not just Aussies, it's also tech news. This has been a crazy, crazy week. It has been an ugly week for a lot of things this week, including, I think, should we start with Facebook? I think so. Oh, my goodness. So Facebook, apparently, in their ad system, which is automated, run by an algorithm, because everything in life should be run by an algorithm, managed to put some of the foulest things you could possibly search for on the web as categories to advertise to. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it wasn't just Facebook. Uh, let's be fair, this is also happening in Google. And basically, any company that sells search results yeah. is going to get caught up in this. Because it's not its not that they had a racist algorithm. It's they were following market trends. And the market trends where there were certain hashtags. <laughs> it turns were, out scumbags advertise on the yeah, internet, too. Uh, th there were certain buys. There were certain tags that were being added to content that were objectionable. Like, for example, uh, uh, the parasitic Jews tag or black people destroy everything. In fact, that one is still active on Google. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this, this has brought out a lot of rage, but I gotta ask you, if, if this was just something that happened because people wanted to buy those tags, can you really fault those advertisers. There's nobody sitting there saying, no, we shouldn't take that, we shouldn't take that. This was all done automatically. You know, as as somebody who's had a lot of quality time with Jesuits, this all of a, it seems like a leading <laughs> question for an ass kicking in a classroom. Um, no, I mean, here's the issue. When you let everything to be, when you allow everything to be automated, then anything can happen. And when anything can happen, things that we find objectionable or evil or downright fundamentally, well, evil, I think is probably a good word, uh, will be part of your business model, which I think is bad. Yeah. And yeah. is being corrected rapidly as we speak, I would imagine, at Facebook and Google and other places. Yeah, they're trying to fix it, but it brings up a larger point. And this is a point that we've talked about before, which is search results in general. There's been a long discussion over the, the last few years mm -hmm. about whether or not you should tweak results to get rid of objectionable content. Well, and there, there are those people who, who say, look, it's all about the algorithm. Let the algorithm decide. And there are other people who say, no, there's some things that you should, as, as a responsible citizen of the internet, remove. Well, and that also comes down to here in the United States, we have a concept called free speech. And free speech generally trumps all sorts of preventing people from looking up and researching evil. And at this point, it gets into a long, drawn out conversation, and we can have that offline. Otherwise, yeah. the chat room will explode, the internet will explode. And uh, it comes down to, you know, I may object tremendously to what you are searching for, but I will not prevent you from searching for it. And on one level, like, well, we have to do that to stop the Nazis. And I agree. Mm. It's always good to punch a Nazi in the face. It's a thing. <laughs> um, I have a history with this involving skinheads in New York. We'll talk about it later. Oh. But um, 
I'm going to take this and move this. But there's also, <laughs> well, but there's also, right, people who would be like, well, people shouldn't be allowed to search for birth control because birth control is abortion yep. and abortion yep. is wrong because Jesus told me. And that gets into, well, okay, if that's wrong, we shouldn't be able to, well, what about speeding? Right? Oh wait, cars shouldn't be able to go perhaps than 55 miles an hour, and you shouldn't be able to eat anything that's not healthy. And it kind of snowballs from there until basically we're all locked into a box where we can be kept safe from ourselves and yep. others and only fed appropriate nutritious information that's been approved by something somewhere. And, and, and we've actually already seen that in the segmentation of the internet. We've got mm -hmm. different countries, and I'm not gonna call them out because everyone kind of knows who they are, who want to filter their internet. Mm -hmm. They want their citizens to only see the things that those citizens should see. <laughs> Our citizens should not be able to figure out how badly we're screwing them Precisely. over. Precisely. <laughs> and, and, and you know, my thing is, there is an opportunity here, mm -hmm. even if we allow the worst, the absolute worst to be linked up, to be searched, to be optimized, we have the opportunity to create an environment in which we can actually have a discussion with people. No, 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 Padre, we have to protect the no, children. No. We have to protect the children from the internet. <laughs> well, I mean, those children are eventually gonna find that information anyways, yeah. some way or some form. So, Which is why we have a internet yeah. in the family room or the kitchen with the parents policy at my house. Cause y'all, have you guys ever found a, a search, like filter that you couldn't get around? Or somebody tells you, well, you can't search for that here in the library at the school in like five minutes. Like, yeah, the heads are nodding. Uh, well, actually, yeah. here, the better question is, how many of you who have parents who are better at technology than you? <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the real thing. that They can all bypass it. So the only responsible thing to do is to be a good citizen. Be a good parent and say, look, you're going to find this. Let me explain why this is a, a good way to accept that or a good way to, to look at it. And at least that's us. That's us. Your mileage may vary. Yeah. By yeah. all means. Yeah. Speaking of mileage, there was a little thing that happened this last week uh, at some new auditorium named after some guy, uh, you know, Steve or something. This is a brief obligatory yeah. mention in the Steve Jobs Auditorium debut usage, which of course would be for the iPhone 8. Wait, the iPhone 7S and the iPhone X. No, wait, ten, it's the ten, iPhone ten. 10. Wait, wait, hold oh, yeah. the yeah. yeah. Don't call it the X. I mock because I'm cruel that way. I'm actually, I want the camera from the iPhone 10, but there's not a chance in hell I'm paying that much for a phone, which makes the camera in the iPhone 8 look really, really attractive. Uh, the Oh, you mean this? This? This, this <laughs> iPhone right here? This one? Yeah. No, this this is this is actually the the 10 right here. Uh-huh. Look at this. Don't drop it. Yeah, no, it's perfect. This this actually is uh, we have this for a segment coming up later in the show. This actually is the iPhone until you kind of do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but uh, this this is a very cool piece of, of tech in that it shows you how the parts and the components mm -hmm. do become widely available even before the announcement because they, they help people design it's crazy. accessories for it. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, when you talk about Foxconn's primary plant having 250,000 people and they're trying to hire more, they actually yeah. have bonuses now because they can't hire enough people yep. into the plant. Um, it's pretty crazy to realize how huge this is, but pretty much everything goes on sale the 15th, uh, shipping on the 22nd. If you didn't pre-order, you already can't get it. The Series 3 watch looks fascinating. It with does. the onboard cell modem. It does. Um, but yeah, the iPhone 10 is going to be available much later this year and probably in smaller volume because the OLED screen or the rumors have it. iPhone 8 is essentially the iPhone 7S and the plus cameras look really good. I still can't believe the iPhone 10 doesn't have flush cameras. Right? I'm disappointed I, I, it about just, that. It's, it seems like that's something that had to be in the next version, but okay, it's it's a new it's technology, new platform. It's the strongest glass ever made, by the way. <laughs> we have the best glass. So it's not gonna the scratch glass. for at least two weeks. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, yeah, wireless charging uh, by the key charging standard, which is amazing at, at Apple actually embracing. Don't forget the standard. notch, or what are you calling it? I'm, the Apple notch, the little thing at the, at the screen mm -hmm. height, what are you calling that? I'm not even calling it anything at this point. Just I'm the more well, I'm curious about facial recognition and how that pans out over time. Oh, and we should mention that a lot of hay was made by the fact that during the demo, the face recognition didn't work properly. And Apple did actually explain it, and it's a perfectly usable excuse, which was several people were handling it, and it tried to do facial recognition on them, and it, it aired out too many times, and so it locked the phone, huh. which is what it was actually designed to do. So, but folks, it's not a bug. It's a feature. It's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Uh, I yeah. Oh, and the Apple TV's gone 4K. Of course, yeah. The most interesting thing about the Apple TV for going 4K is not that they've finally broken down and caught up for the rest of the industry, not that they're charging twice what a Roku would cost, but that they actually have negotiated with every or all of the major Hollywood studios to get 4K UHD movies at $20 each, which is like 50% or 30% less 
yeah. than almost all the other available streaming 4K movies to buy. But more importantly, uh, it's everybody but Disney slash Marvel slash they're starting their own slash streaming slash network in 2019, and you're going to slash pay a delete expletive slash fortune. Yeah, for and content. in 2021, Disney will now be available on all platforms when their streaming platform fails. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what you can come to expect. Now, Patrick. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel about this? Because 4K is great. Whenever I do a 4K video demo on mm -hmm. an actually decent screen, it looks gorgeous, but I consume most of my streaming on my laptop, and 1080p or 4K doesn't really make a difference. Well, I think for in terms of in terms of 4K, HDR is more important than 4K. The yeah. higher resolution is nice, but it's more of a gimmick, right, unless right. you're like four feet from your screen. But HDR 10, Dolby Vision, um, high, you know, basically. High dynamic range is much more apparent, I think, or, or it pops much more to the human eye because yeah. of the way we evolved. Um, I'm very curious to see how this rolls out because Roku's been out with this for a while. There's still not a huge t amount of content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in terms of like streaming video, yeah, phones are the primary source for most people. But then again, I know a lot of people who actually have HD TVs, or in my case, projection screens, and I think it'll do well for them. Right, and, and Gray Raven in the, in the chat room actually brings up a really good point, which is far more important than the 4K announcement is the HDR announcement. Yeah. If you haven't seen HDR, it is phenomenal. Yeah. It is, that is the, the true promised land. I know it gets buried a lot because people don't really understand what HDR is, but just imagine the blackest blacks and the brightest brights being able to coexist on one screen. Yeah. It looks wonderful. You, you don't realize how much of the picture you've actually missed until you see yeah. something in true HDR. And it's funny, somebody pointed out, they buried the lead on the Apple TV, not only 4K, but HDR. Yes, at this point, if you do 4K without HDR, I would be making fun of you for not having HDR. I apologize for not yeah. making that abundantly clear. Uh, now, if you want to find out anything else about the Apple announcements, go check out MacBray, go check out iOS Today. We covered them all here on the Twit TV network, and, uh, well, I think, I think we're done with that. Yeah, it's good stuff, and if you're an Apple fan, you should probably look at it, although I, I will say, and this is going to be the the Jesuit in me. If you have a 7, there's no reason for you to get an 8 or, or a 10. Not yet. Yeah. Are you with that? I... Yeah. Maybe okay. if, you have the, if you have the plus. If you have the plus, the yeah. better camera. We'll do that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to this one. This is the story, Patrick, that just keeps on giving. Equifax. Cass oh, I thought you were going to say Cassini. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Goodbye, that's Cassini. Sad. Goodbye, Cassini. You went out in style. Oh, yeah, okay. Equifax, one of the major credit reporting agencies here in the United States, basically has all the information on all the uh, people in the United States, or at least 143 million of them. And guess what? It was hacked. Woo! That's now, not important. They actually revealed a bit more about how it was hacked, and this is getting security professionals even more upset because it turns out that at least in one web interface mm -hmm. that they found, they hadn't changed the default password and username, <laughs> so that's that's a good thing. They also found out that they had an unpatched version of Struts, which is a, a piece of architecture that is used all over the internet, but for some reason, the security folk at Equifax didn't feel the need to update a critical flaw, which, which is absolutely horrible. Now, this story has been getting worse and worse and worse because well, they keep finding new bits of horrible. Like, for example, the security officer, the person who was responsible for making sure that all of our data was secured, had no background in security whatsoever. In fact, it looks like it was one of these sort of bro hires. Uh, hey, oh, I know you. Hey, take this job. This Jimmy likes job. security. He's got a password manager. Let Jimmy run security. Uh, it, it was really that. And, and, you know, when you start looking at the amount of data yeah. that was actually breached, this is not going away anytime soon. It's social securities, it's driver license numbers, it's addresses, it's age, phone number. Uh, you know, it's everything we are is now out there. Yeah, so for all of you who are like, well, you know, the whole OPM thing, office personal management, pff, government employees, whatever. <laughs> I bit you on the ass, didn't it? Because this is everyone. Yeah. So I was actually affected by the OPM breach, so uh, my stuff's already out there. But, but I mean... There are a couple of things that you can do. Uh, Leo talked about them last week on this show. Mm -hmm. We've talked about them ad nauseum on the Twit TV network. You can watch the last episode of Know How. We yeah. did an episode called Equifix It, which we actually take you down through some of the different options and the strategies that you should be using for controlling your credit. Also, hint, don't pay Equifax no. for a service to mm -hmm. monitor your credit. Yeah. They've already proved themselves grossly incompetent once. Why pay them to be grossly incompetent a second time when you can actually monitor your own credit report for right. free? 
Uh, there's actually an, uh, a corollary to this, which is mm -hmm. some people are going for the full-on freeze, the credit yes. freeze. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. I'm How, a fan of the freeze. I, I, I like the freeze. I, I started with the fraud alert just because mm -hmm. it's easy. Uh, again, go to the know-how episode. We show you how to do it online. Mm -hmm. Once you report it to one of the CRCs, the credit reporting companies, they have to spread it to the other CRCs. Yes. So one is enough. Uh, it works for 90 days, but because you can do it all online, it's actually relatively simple yeah. to renew it every 90 days. I started with that because the freeze is a little different. You do have to go to the three different big CRCs individually. Right. You may have to pay a fee, although right now it's kind of being waived. You may have to pay a fee to lift it, and it is a bit more restrictive. In fact, there's... So basically, the thing that actually keeps yeah. your data secure and makes it incredibly complicated for people to spoof your identity, they yeah. charge you for going in and going out. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and right now, people who are trying to pre-order iPhones are running into this because they put a credit freeze, mm -hmm. and of course, that actually gets checked. Yeah. When, when you go to buy a new phone, they will check your credit report. And a lot of people don't realize how many times your credit is checked, not just when you're trying to get yeah. a new line of credit, but if you're applying for a job, one of the basic things to do is to check the credit rating of the well, person you're going to hire. If you don't opt out, there were basically organizations will just continue to hammer your information constantly just because they can, because they want to send you more credit card offers that you don't need. Yeah. yeah. In any case. Yeah, it's, you know what? I think that's going to do it for the hot topics. But, you know, Patrick, we do have a crazy, ridiculous show. We are going to show people mm -hmm. a little project that uh, I, I'm going to call them a maker. A master maker has put together to install, reinstall that three point five millimeter audio jack that people love so much back into a modern iPhone. So cool. Yeah, and we're also going to be doing a little something something uh, with uh, disaster preparedness. I, I am assuming that's what this is for? Well, we'll talk about whether or not you can carry that or not. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, if, you're, if you don't want to go to that extreme, Jason Howell's going to be dropping by to show us how to charge. <laughs> Are you, you getting nervous with me with that? No, thing? I just don't want an international incident. Oh, okay, that's true. But we, he's going to be able to charge a phone with a 9-volt battery. It's all coming up on this episode. But first, you know what I want to do? What? I want to take a gander over to another part of the studio so we can learn all about drilling into an iPhone. This is cool. All right, let's, let's, take, a, let's take a walk down to the... Uh, the fun side of the studio. Oh, I haven't been here in so long. Oh, uh, we're here with Scotty. Scotty Allen. Now, Scotty, in front of you is a impressive array of parts. Yeah. But it's not just for giggles. You actually had a purpose in taking apart the iPhone. Yeah. What yeah. did you want to do? Well, I I went and bought a new iPhone 7 about four or five months ago. And I <laughs> It was somewhat of a last minute purchase. And I had forgotten that they removed the headphone jack from the iPhone 7. And I was really annoyed. <laughs> uh, I like my head. I have nice headphones that plug into my headphone you jack. Beyond, I was really annoyed. Let's just say that that was the beginning of a four month project that ended up with you having yeah. a headphone jack in your iPhone 7. This is, I mean, I do annoyed like every Tuesday. <laughs> this is way beyond annoyed. This is like well, vengeance. I, yeah. I mean, I basically decided if, if they weren't going to put a headphone jack in an iPhone 7, why wouldn't, why shouldn't I? Okay, wait, well, hold on, hold on. Because I was told in all the reports that the reason why they removed the jack in the first place was that it just plain wouldn't fit. They'd made it so slim, they'd made it so small that a 3.5 millimeter jack would just bulge out of the case. Well, I read that as well, Padre. And <laughs> I thought, when I started this, I thought the headphone jack was gonna go on the back of the phone. Like I thought I was gonna make another case like for the phone. Okay. Yeah, or like a bump on the back. And it wasn't until I bought another phone, I bought a used phone, uh, and I should say, this is all happening in China. So I bought a used phone in the markets in China, and I took it home and I cracked it open. And it wasn't a phone. <laughs> no, no, it was a phone. It was a phone. No, 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 the, the, the markets are actually really legit in China. I've had um, nothing but great experiences okay. in the markets. I've had no problems with people scamming me. Um, but I opened it up, and I started taking parts out, and I went, I mean, in particular, I was looking at the area where the headphone jack is in an iPhone success. And I said, what's in that corner? Like, I want to know what they put there. Because like, one, the, one of the things they said is, they said they removed the headphone jack because it was taking up too much room. Right. And then so, they st stuffed something much bigger than a headphone jack in that space. Right. And so I wanted to know, well, what is that? What was it? It was a piece of plastic. No, wait, whoa. I was told that it was the vent for the barometric sensor. Well, I was told that too. It may and very well be a vent I'm, for a barometric sensor. I'm no barometric engineer, but I have the two parts here that they could be talking about. Uh, this is the bigger piece, and this is what I believe, at least in an article by The Verge, they said was the barometric vent. 
Does that look like a barometric that, vent no. to you? Having never actually seen a barometric vent, just a barometer, I have no idea. That is a, that's a mounting post. Basically, I that just lets them tack on other pieces of equipment. No, I think it's just a bracket. It oh. sits over, this is the connector here for the, so this, this has a bunch of my parts on it, but this black thing is what sits in the bottom of the phone right here, like this. And this is the, the, um, where the taptic engine connects. Mm -hmm. And this thing sits over the top of it. I think it just holds on that connector. It looks okay. like this, and I think it just holds it on. It, it screws down into two screws. I think it's just to prevent that from popping off. And they have these similar brackets all over the phone uh, that do similar things. Most of them are made of metal, and they're smaller than this. Got it. And I think that this piece is actually the barometric vent they were talking about. Mm -hmm. This actually plugs into the bottom of the case over behind these holes here. Right. right? And right. I think that's what makes those holes waterproof. And I think there's some sort of membrane or something in here that allows air in and out, but not water. And that's what they were talking about. You know, before we run through the process of how you actually did this, I, I gotta ask, what is your background? I mean, are you yeah. an engineer? What what drives a sane, I'm assuming you're yeah. sane, a sane person to want to take wondered. apart a really expensive device to put something that the manufacturer hasn't included? Well, that's a great question. I, I've wondered my sanity multiple times throughout this project. Uh, I am an engineer by background, but I'm a software engineer by background. Okay. So I used to work at how Google. Hard can hard be? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, exactly, right? Uh, I used to work at Google on web search, um, so I'm, I, uh, the, your discussion of, of yes. search results yes. is, is very uh, close to my heart. Um, and a couple of years ago, I got the opportunity to go to China as part of a hacker trip to China, uh, led by a friend of mine, Mitch Altman. And uh, I got there and I said, oh wow, this is a geek's paradise. I completely <laughs> fell in love. And I've been coming and going ever since. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, that's what's led me down this road of crazy iPhone adventures. So you have the phone. You decide it needs a headphone jack. You buy one to play around with. You yep. pull it open. You remove the barometric filter. Yep. Um, and this other piece of plastic. This other piece I of plastic. Which I don't think is what they were talking about. What happens next? Well, I got the uh, I got a headphone jack mm -hmm. from a an iPhone 6s. This is actually one from a five that I ended up using, but I got one from a 6s that I had, um, and I I looked at it and I said, I wonder if this will fit, and I started fitting in and I went, I think there's a possibility that this will go into that hole where this piece of plastic was, Are you and this doesn't that Apple seem all that. Lied about the space. Well. Apple I don't want to go that to far. Take advantage of the opportunity. I don't know. I give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. I think I don't think that there was like a whole bunch of ill will here. I think that at some point, I think at one point maybe the iPhone Seven had a headphone jack in it, mm -hmm. and at some point it got removed. And they kind of, I suspect it was late in the design process, and they kind of shuffled some things into right. that into that space. Um, they moved the Taptic engine over. They um, you know, they added this clip. They had there was a clip on top of the on the bottom side of the screen that fits into that hole. I think everybody that that worked in that area of the phone went, "Ooh, more room! Yeah. Like, let's hence, shuffle in." There. Hence the magical uh, bracket. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. It's, it's, let's make um, sure that there's something in there so people don't say, yes. "Oh, there's a big empty space where right. this used to be." Right. Okay. There are plenty of other sort of theories as to what Apple's motivation was to <laughs> remove the headphone jack. I I don't have a particular opinion. Um, if their only reason was there wasn't enough room, I think that I have some proof that maybe that wasn't the case. Wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's get super geeky here because this yeah. is it's not just a matter of dropping a 3.5 millimeter jack into no. the case because you have to go from digital to analog, and if they remove the headphone jack, they don't have that there anymore. Right. Yeah. The how? DAC is actually currently in the right. It's yes. in the dongle. So right. how did you get a DAC back into the casing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I started out pretty naive on this project. I thought maybe I would, I started poking around and I thought maybe I'd get lucky and just find like vestigial lines that I could hook up to for the headphone jack. <laughs> that was- probably left the pads and I can solder the jack on there. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Along that was, with a note, uh, analog jack here. Yeah, right, exactly, it's solder here to add jack. So that didn't happen, um, obviously. That was very naive. Right. Um, so then I kind of, uh, Figured out, was trying to think like what else can I do, right? I bought a bunch of um, like copy adapters from the markets, mm -hmm. and they were all it. They all turned out to be pretty low quality. The only like DAC, you know, headphone adapter that I could find that was really good was the one that Apple makes. That's not cheap. No, they're not cheap. They're about nine to ten dollars. They're a little bit more than that in oh, China. Oh, for an Apple accessory, it's cheap. That's it is. <laughs> it's cheap for a dongle it's from true. Apple, but they're yeah, really cheap, cheap until you buy like twenty of them, oh. and then they start to add up. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have bought a lot of these and cracked them open. But I am actually, the, I'm getting the DAC and all the headphone logic out of this plug here. And that's actually the, um, the blue board here on my circuit. He is wow. actually the inside, so it's actually that right there. Oh, it lines uh, up perfectly. Yeah, it lines up perfectly. And these wires here are soldered on to where the lightning connector is. So you just tapped right off the lightning connector. Exactly. Okay. So conceptually, what I start, what the place I started was, can I just hook up this lightning adapter to the, the lightning jack? Can I just solder wires directly between those? And that took me like two or three weeks because I had to like learn how to solder that small. So I had yeah. to go buy a new microscope. I had to get fancy tweezers. I had to find the right wire. And like, so I went through, you know, probably five of these in the process and a whole bunch of these. And so you got like, really good at soldering. I got really good. No, I got really good. I now own this amazing microscope. And you have a super fine tip soldering iron. Super fine tip soldering okay. iron, really nice tweezers, really fine wire. Um, and now I would actually say it's not that hard. It's pretty easy. I can do one of these in, um, you know, just doing the, the wiring of that, I can do it in 10 or 15 minutes and, and get it pretty right every time. Now, I know you had to strip it out of its casing yep. to, to get that in there, but was, was that, removing it from its casing, was that enough to make it clear everything it needed to clear inside the case? No. Oh. So I had other problems right at the end of the project. Well, so, okay, so the plan was to take this board, it's pretty, pretty narrow this way. I thought I would be able to get that vertically in the case. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, that was just the plan, right? Now, if I was a smart person, I would have tested that. <laughs> but happened? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so I just kind of assumed that would work. It looked like it would work. Um, I have a feeling this goes, why won't this corner go all the way snap? Yes. Okay. Oh. So that wasn't, that wasn't quite where I started. I, I, I then realized, okay, I'm not gonna be able to put this vertically. So I put it actually over the top of the Taptic engine. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the Taptic engine actually goes underneath here. Um, and this, uh, so this board sits on top of the Taptic engine, okay. which is not really recommended engineering practice, right? Yeah. So I ended up having to like- <laughs> Every time you get a call, you're vibrating the components. That's, right. okay, yes, that's fine. Right, I'm sure Apple engineers are cringing when they hear this. <laughs> um, so I started like removing other protective brackets. Like I started removing stuff off the screen. I started like uh, dremeling out the case underneath the Taptic engine. I was moving the, uh, the Taptic I, engine I'm is like shifted. I'm starting to see why you had three phones because yes. yeah, this is a really good way to bust it. Eventually I got to the point that everything fit in the phone, but as you said there was like this little gap at the bottom of the phone <laughs> right and I, and there were moments where I did exactly what you said where I'm like so there are clips on the side of the phone that right. you have to clip in as you're closing the screen up and I'm closing it up and then finally it just goes crunch oh. and all of a sudden like the bottom part of the screen has spider weird, webs. you know spider webs oh. and the the digitizer's not working we anymore. all know that and, so I went through probably, I don't know, five or six screens, um, which, you know, yeah, one up. isn't that bad, but five or six, it starts to add up. And, and it just, it sucks at your morale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not again! <laughs> yeah. So how did you actually manage to, did you, did you grind off enough of the epoxy over the deck? I just basically you? removed everything that I possibly could, including all of the protective mechanisms that the engineers have put in to prevent stuff from breaking in the phone. So the last thing that I removed was actually the epoxy layer off the top of one tiny capacitor on this board, which sticks up a little higher than everything else. Oh my and goodness. it's it's a waterproofing, let's see if I can show the camera here. There is there is a little tiny brown dot right there, and uh, right there, and that was what was causing the screens to break. It was sticking up maybe a, fra a fraction of a millimeter. Uh, and just that enough. was just pushing on the back of the digitizer enough to crack it. So you finally figure this last element out, you get the case closed, you've Got the headphone. Well, actually, the headphone jack took what, like 19 cases to figure out? No, probably like 10 to 15, maybe. Oh, oh all yeah. Right. 10 to 15. <laughs> I was lucky enough to buy a lot of used cases on the street. There are vendors that just sell used cases from, from taking apart phones. Mm -hmm. And so those were like cannon fodder for the CNC machine, like when we were dialing in all the settings. Right. Because um, they're all scratched up anyway, and I can get them for really cheap, like a dollar or two per case on the street. So oh, wow. um, you buy them in stacks of 10. So um, 15 cases later, yeah. you finally shave down the capacitor, it closes. How satisfying was it to plug the headphones in and actually hear music? It was pretty satisfying, but that moment came like weeks or months earlier because like I had I had everything working. As long as you yeah. didn't want to close the phone. Right. As long as you had the phone <laughs> spread out on the table. As, as long as right. you were okay with the components kind of just hanging by wires, it worked. Right, exactly. So I'd already had that like satisfaction moment like three or four times months ago. Right. And by that point I was just like beaten down and I was like, oh, thank God I can stop closing cases. Like, thank God I can. <laughs> and I basically have just never opened this phone again since Why that moment. Why would you? Yeah, because Ever. I'm terrified. No. And you're it. never gonna update because no. you need to stay with this phone 
phone because you're not going to want to do that with an eight or a ten. Right. I'm just oh I'm well, just throw that out. Well, I wouldn't really. Okay. I've had a lot of people asking me, "Can you do this with an eight or a 10? And I think it's only fair to try. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this is so? Is this now a personal obsession, or are you contemplating a business? No, uh, I'm not contemplating a business. I did make a few um, boards of the bear boards just mm -hmm. um, for Strange Parts fans. Uh, you know, I've, I've framed them and then doing kind of a, a limited edition signed thing. But no, I um, have no interest in, in making kits. Or <laughs> so anything. We're, we're not going to see you um, clutching this down by the river saying, no. my precious. No, 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 no. You're, well, actually, you may see him clutching that down by the river saying, my precious. He's just not going to make any more preciouses for That's anybody right. else. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I, I, for me, this is first and foremost about storytelling. Right. It's, it's first and foremost about telling a cool story about an interesting project in an interesting place, right? So, mm -hmm. so a big piece of this is being in China in the markets and the entirely different way of doing engineering in China versus in the U.S. It's very from the ground up there. Mm -hmm. Yes. For example, the, there's a, a headphone company called Hi-Fi Man, and the person who runs it now is a PhD in like basically nano materials. Yeah. But he started out repairing broken electronics, and that's how yes. he sort of financed everything, yes. including his education. And that is and incredibly business. common in mm -hmm. Shenzhen. It's it's very much like people start out with cottage industries, mm -hmm. right, where they've got a tiny little business, and then they just grow and grow and grow. Like the the amount of opportunity there is so huge. You know, um, I, I did a tour of Shenzhen a while back, and the, the factories were interesting because yeah. you got to see how massive the tooling is to create these products. But when you started walking the back streets and you just found what was there, and you're just going, how is this possible? I mean, I, I can literally assemble my own insert name here yes. just from the stuff I grab off these parts bins. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it is kind of magical. I find phone parts like in the cracks in the sidewalk walking down the street, <laughs> literally. Uh, yeah. Did you find any screens that you could replace the cracked ones with? I generally, generally the, the ecosystem is pretty efficient about routing uh, things that have any value to a place where they can right. extract value out of it. So, I, no. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta ask you though. So this took four months. Yeah. It took a couple of phones, a whole lot of screens, some parts, a lot of frustration. Yeah. Would you do it again? Knowing what you know now. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, I love that. Absolutely. Will I do this project again at this magnitude? No, because I have so many other things I'm excited to go do. So um, I'm really excited to explore out of cell phones. I'm really excited to explore out of, outside of China. Um, Strange Parts for me is really about the intersection of like travel and adventure and technology and sort of finding these cool stories to tell, these cool adventures to go on. Uh, on the fringes of our technological industrial world. So um, that's awesome. Now it's we know lot. that you're you're going to take a look at the eight. You're going to yes. take a look at the ten. <laughs> yep. What is next for Strange Parts? Because it's obviously a good you, you've got a lot of heat right now. You got to yeah. use it. It's a good question. I don't. I I haven't chosen my next story yet. To be to be tr totally truthful, I have a long list of stuff I'm excited about. But um, what I will say is, it's not going to be cell phones, and it's not going to be China. One word. Zune. Yeah. Yeah, Chocolate bring it back. June. Too bring soon, it back. man. Bring it back. Yeah. Okay, okay. Before we go, though, we have to actually see it. Do you want to actually see yeah, it? Yeah, I, I want to see this in operation. Just right, see. because Let we will sure have audience members who say this was all a sham. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's been my fear is that, like, there were so many hoaxes on YouTube of right. this when the, when the <laughs> iPhone 7 was first announced. I was worried that people would just think this was another another scam. And so um, I've been very eager to show it off to um, people that can verify. And this should give us the full operation as if you were just plugged into the dongle, because mm -hmm. it is the dongle, but yes. inside the case. right, exactly. That's right. the right way to think about it. So that's the speaker. Mm -hmm. OK. And then here are the headphones. So just to prove it, there we go. Yep. Oh, oh. Bluetooth on or off. <laughs> and you can push the buttons if you want. Oh, yeah. Volume works. Oh, so full operation. I like this. Oh. Can I do a long, a long press? Yeah. Oh, Siri not, not, oh, not okay. connected. That, that was smart. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this. I mean, I love it when a project works. But again, as you mentioned, you had that feeling early on in the project. Yes. <laughs> I had that feeling did months you, ago. Did you ever want to give up? Just say, oh, it's just too much. Absolutely. I, you know, for me, by the time that I had everything in the case. I had everything but the screen on the phone. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. The only thing I'm lacking is I'm lacking a phone that I can say it works, you know? And so, yeah, at that point when I was starting to break screens and I was, I was just reaching this point where I didn't have anything more I could shave off. Right. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Like, maybe this is just not possible. I like that. That's, that is the face of a man yeah. who is so over it. 
<laughs> that was a pretty low point. Uh, that was a pretty low point. Um, I, it took a lot of willpower to actually turn on the camera and, and say that at that point because I was so low that I didn't want to talk to anybody. You said 10 screens. Uh, how many of those screens were broken because you threw it against the wall? None. Okay, like, I came all right. really close. <laughs> <laughs> We've been speaking with Scotty Allen. Scotty, could you please tell our audience where they can find you, where they can find your channel, yes. and of course, where they're going to find your next project? Yes, absolutely. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Strange Parts. You can go to youtube.com slash strange parts. Oh, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Yes. Thank you for sharing this tech and sharing a maker project that I think a lot of us wish we could do, but hopefully you're going to watch his his channel and realize don't do it. Yeah, a lot of us yeah. wish someone else would do it for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, oh, actually, if you send your phone to Scotty, he'll do it for you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. If no, you send your phone to Scotty, no. it's going to be routed to the most efficient reuse <laughs> in Shenzhen, China. Yes, I can guarantee efficient recycle. <laughs> I, I, we actually wanted to do a parody of your video where we took one, we just duct taped it, a, uh, a, a dongle I to the back. Wish you had. I wanted to dremel through a screen and yeah. just put the jack in there, but yeah, I think this great. works a lot better. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Now, folks, coming up next, we've got Megan Maroney continuing her digital cleanse. That's right. Do you live in the digital world? Are you a citizen of the Internet? Are you tired of your digital toxins coursing through your system? Well, if so, stay tapped because she's going to give you part five of the cleanse. But before we do that, let's take a moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of the new screensavers. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you enjoy applying for a mortgage? Of course you don't. Who has ever said that? It is a horrible, horrible process. It normally involves you gathering together all your financial information, walking into a bank with a person who is probably very rude and disinterested in you, trying to assume whether or not you are a person they want to give money to. Well, folks, you could get rid of that because that's the old era. We're in the digital era. and the digital era, everything has to be easier. Everything has to be Rocket Mortgage by Quicken. Now, Rocket Mortgage is the best way to bring your mortgage into the new generation. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed to be client focused, a technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. This isn't a cookie cutter solution where they're going to try to force you into one of the options. They will take all of your information and figure out what is the best mortgage that fits your style of life, your income, and what you want to do with it. It's also convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at a touch of a button. There's no more banker's boxes filled with receipts and old pay stubs. It's powerful. Now, whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds, just like Patrick Norton. Now, based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options that are available for you and find the one that fits you just right. It's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. That's rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of the new screensavers. Now let's go ahead and jump over to Megan Maroney. If you are a little concerned about what you've been accumulating in your digital life, here's part, four, part five of her cleanse. <laughs> Welcome back to the Twit Digital Cleanse. We are at week five, which means we're halfway there, friends. I hope you appreciated the break that we took last week, and I hope you used it to do a little cleansing on your own. Keep on telling me how you're doing. Either email me at megan at twit.tv, or you can tweet at me at Megan Maroney using the hashtag digital cleanse. You can also leave a comment on our YouTube playlist, which you can easily find by searching for digital cleanse on YouTube. To recap, we have cleaned up our notifications, achieved inbox zero, purged useless apps, and thinned out our cloud storage. Now it's time to tackle the big kahuna your hard drive. Whether you're using a Mac or a PC, step one is to get your updates, security updates, obviously, but you also wanna be running the newest version of any operating system that you can run. 
I understand that's not always possible because of cost, but do what you can. Updates are the first step in digital detox of any operating system or any software at all, for that matter. For Mac updates, go to the Apple menu, choose About This Mac, and then click Software Update. To update your Windows machine, just type Update in the search box on the taskbar, and then click Check for Updates. Step two is to simply restart your computer and close all the apps, programs, tabs, and web browsers that you're not using. Since most computers often go to sleep and we don't have to power them off and on like the old days, you can find that you have a lot of stuff open that you're just not using. A restart can help you feel like a million bucks. Now, let's trash some files. If you want to know why this is so painful, check my scientific explanation from the digital cleanse we did of our cloud storage. Then, just grit your teeth and get going. On a Mac, type files in the search box and then sort by size. Then, begin the deleting process. I deleted old audiobooks that are also in my library on the cloud, giant videos that are also uploaded to YouTube and elsewhere, and lots and lots of duplicate files. If you have to spend more than 10 minutes manually deleting duplicate files, you might want to invest in some software to automate the process. For the Mac, I like Gemini by MacPaw. Just tap the plus icon and then choose a recommended folder or add a custom folder to scan. Then click Scan for Duplicates. Review your results or choose Smart Cleanup. If your problem is bigger than just duplicate files, try Clean My Mac 3, also by MacPaw. You can download the software for free and remove 500 megabytes, but to remove more than that, it'll cost you 40 bucks. And now on to the Windows cleanse. There are so many different ways to clean out your hard drive if you're using Windows 10. I asked Padre about his cleansing process and he said, back up to OneDrive, do a factory reset, and then a clean install. He says you probably don't need much of the software you've downloaded anyway. That is a little bit too hardcore of a cleanse for me. Here are a few quicker tips for digitally cleansing your Windows machine. First, get rid of the software that you don't use anymore. In Windows 10, you can now use the Settings app to uninstall both desktop programs and Windows Store apps. Type apps and features into the search bar, then sort by size. Find the apps you don't use anymore or that you never used, thank them for their service, and then select uninstall. You can also detoxify your Windows machine by deleting temporary files. Search for disk cleanup in the search bar and then detox by getting rid of downloaded program files, temporary internet files, your recycle bin, and much more. If you've done your best to digitally cleanse your PC and Mac and you still feel a little bloated, I have one last tip for you. Consider getting a Chromebook. With everything on the cloud, you're much less likely to fill your hard drive with gunk. Padre recommends the Acer R13. He says it feels good, it looks good, and you can get one between three and $400. If you currently have a Chromebook and you still want to do a cleanse, do a factory reset. Click on your profile photo, open settings, and scroll down to the advanced section, and then click the power wash icon. You'll feel like you just drank a gallon of fresh squeezed beet juice. Ah. And now, it's gold star time. Thank you to Raj Peeps on YouTube who had a great tip for cleansing your iPhone. Raj said, I got my iPhone down to two pages and added a few folders of productivity. I moved all entertainment games photography apps to my iPad. The big screen makes much more sense to use those particular apps. And a gold star goes to Christopher for pointing me to the TED Talk by Manoush Zamarodi on how boredom can lead to your most brilliant ideas. Now, I've interviewed Manoush several times, and our digital cleanse was inspired by her bored and brilliant project from 2015. If you want to take your cleanse to the next level, check out Manoush's new book, Bored and Brilliant, How Spacing Out Can Unlock Your Most Productive and Creative Self. Just be aware that one of her tips is to go through an entire day without taking a photo of anything. Maybe it's just me, but that seems worse than giving up coffee. And our final gold star of the week goes to Esben on Twitter, who says he allows notifications to show in the notification center and nowhere else. You never get nagged and you never see those obnoxious red notification badges on your apps. Brilliant suggestion, Esben. And that's it for this week, cleansers. 
I want your ideas. Hashtag Digital Cleanse on Twitter or YouTube or Instagram for that matter. Don't forget that we are in this together. Stay tuned for next week when we get really serious and clean out our passwords. I am Megan Maroney and I host iOS Today every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Thanks to Megan Maroney. Of course, you can catch Megan every day on Tech News Today at mm -hmm. 4 p.m. Pacific time at twit.tv, as well as with Leo Laporte on Tuesdays for iOS Today. And uh, she's actually become one of my rotating co-hosts for Know How. So, nice. Yeah, she adds a nice little, um, I'm going to say, uh, intelligence to the show that wasn't there before. For song. For song, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I got to ask you about okay. your digital cleansing habits. How often do you feel the need to sort of just blow everything up and start over? Uh, it depends on what, if, are we talking about the machines that I test software on? Or are we testing about like? The answer is yes. Uh, yes, I mean, I try to I try to rebuild all of my machines at least once every six months. Yeah. Back the data off, wipe it down to bare metal, reinstall Windows 10, go through the whole traumatic procedure and start over again. Uh, we will be doing a refresh for Windows in a future know-how and I have to say, Windows 10 did get one thing very, very right, and that is storing all of your licenses in your Microsoft account. That makes it so much easier rather than having to punch in keys and nothing wrong with where. trusting Microsoft. Yes, yes. Always good to have a spare copy Absolutely. before you wipe the drive to bare metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just, you know, pro tips. Pro, pro tips. tips. Speaking <laughs> of pro tips, I think it's time for us to help someone out there who has a little problem. Let's go ahead and jump to a call for help. We've got Jim from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Jim, what's your question? Hi. I recently rewrote my entire CD library to Apple Lossless, and I listened primarily just with headphones. I uh, picked up some high-res headphones, and I listened to it through iTunes with a 5K iMac. I think it sounds good, but I'm wondering if something like a DAC would enhance that even more. Okay, before we get to that, we do have to address something that's very, very important, and that is the fact that I love your T-shirt. Thank you for the, uh, the the Bowie and the TARDIS, as well as the Twit stickers on the case behind you. So, sir, I salute you. But to the DAC question, Patrick, this is something I hear all the time from people who maybe they're getting a bit more serious about their music collection, and they, they want to know... Should I just trust the DAC that's in my device, or do I need something special? Yes and no. I mean, first of all, I'm holding f like one, two, three, four DACs in between my two hands uh, right now. This is not all the DACs I no, own. No. Uh, I review these a lot, and I have audio nerd issues in a really, really bad way. You've got a set of Sony, uh, I want to say V600s, did you tell us? I actually upgraded. I've got their, well, I've got the box there at work, but they're Sony the Hurons. Huh. I haven't played with that set. I've never even they, heard they of that. They support uh, the high-res audio. Okay, let's let's pause there for a moment. High-res audio is a marketing term. Yeah. Um, now you could talk about high-resolution audio where they've like they've oversampled or they've used longer bit words, but high-res audio technically, this headphone, this headphone, this headphone. Anybody have a headphone in here? Raise your hands. Anybody? There you go. None of you own headphones. You own earbuds. <laughs> I was like, do children not listen to music anymore? Excuse me, young adults. Um, technically, anything that can play music, if it's got a full range of like the human hearing from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, qualifies as a high resolution headphone. Now, there is marketing agreements where there's like a high resolution band that show up on some stuff, but just because a headphone says it's high resolution doesn't mean it's necessarily a great headphone. So, um, those are probably good headphones. Like some of my standbys, you know, for, for not too much money, uh, the Sony MDR7506. For people out there who want to upgrade your headphone game, this is a fantastic headphone. Uh, probably the, one of the best headphones you can get for under $200. Sells for about $75. Bucks. Uh, is about as attractive uh, as a small Soviet-designed vehicle, but my, most small Soviet-designed things will last approximately forever, including if you use them to hammer in tent pegs. Those are a set of Sennheiser um, Momentums. They now call the, the, these the HDs because they're into the HD craze. This is the Momentum 1. The Momentum 2 is out there. This is one of the best headphones you can buy. These typically sell for 80 to 100 bucks now, depending on where you're shopping. Um, fantastic, clean, relatively natural, neutral audio. Uh, these... These look like they're well <laughs> well traveled. These uh, have been abused more than probably any other headphone I will ever own. I'd like to apologize to them publicly now. This is a Bard Dynamic DT770. It's a studio headphone. 
uh, that was originally kind of engineered for, for musicians. That's why it's a sealed headphone. Not as fancy as an open back headphone, not as open a sound, but again, something that has a really amazing sound quality. And as you can see, I think these are 15 years old now? Yeah, just about. Um, and it's like headphones and speakers uh, tend not to wear out, at least the modern ones that don't yeah. have the rubber surrounds. I bring all that up because you want to make sure, you want to spend most of your money on the transducer, the thing that converts the audio signal into what you actually hear. So headphones are important, speakers are important. Um, that's like, the fact that you've gone to lossless is phenomenal, right? Because you're hearing a lot of detail you've never heard in the music before. Okay. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest things. Like 160 is not bad, by the time you get up to 300 kilobit um, file compression or 300, whether it's not, MP3 is not my favorite, but when you get up to 300 kilobits, it starts getting really, really hard to hear the difference between that and a complete lossless file. I just go straight lossless yeah. because storage is cheap and you never know what you might want to convert it into. So once you've got a good set of headphones that you're really comfortable with, yes, a DAC can make a difference. The DAC in your MacBook's probably pretty good and the headphone amp's probably pretty good, um, but it's amazing what stepping up can lead to. Ooh, you've got some candy here, Patrick. Yeah, what are those? so this is, uh, this is the Dragonfly Black, which is currently sells for about a hundred bucks. This is one of my favorite digital analog converters. It's also uh, a headphone amplifier. Um, it is made by, it's the second one I've owned. This is the first one I bought. This is the second one I bought. These are both from a company called AudioQuest. Yes, AudioQuest sells $10,000 uh, you know, speaker cables, don't buy those. This though, <laughs> this is a fantastic piece of engineering because there's the DAC chip itself. Like you hear things like AK4490, uh, Burr Brown, ESS Sabre DACs. The DAC is part of it, but everything you surround the DAC with is gonna determine whether or not the DAC does a good job making the decision to go from the, the digital bits into the analog waveform that actually moves the speaker that hits your ear. Um, AudioQuest Dragonfly is a fantastic place to start. Uh, the black is more than enough. It's got like an ESS 9010 Sabre DAC inside of it. It's got a really, really nice headphone amplifier. Unless you have like really, 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 really outrageously demanding um, uh, like planar magnetic headphones, it's going to drive whatever you got. And it's about a hundred bucks. Um, another fantastic piece of hardware to kind of move up to when you're like, I want to do something better than what's inside of my computer. Uh, it's from a company called <coughs> Shit. S-C- H I I T. That's getting a shout out in the chat room. So it, yes, these guys yes. are amazing. They're down in Southern California, um, and the shit full of two. Yeah, this, this shit is bananas. These are a bunch of guys who've been in the audio industry for a few decades. And a few years ago, they decided they wanted to do three things: make amazing audio affordable. They wanted to make as much of their gear as possible in the United States, and they wanted to have as much fun as possible doing it. So they have like, if you go to the head-fi.com, if you go to HeadFi, uh, which is an extraordinary website for headphone enthusiasts and audio, um, one of the co-founders has this like gigantic 82,000 page thread on the history of the company. What you want to take a look at is something called the Shit Fulla 2. Um, and there's three things that are going on about this. It's got an AK4490 uh, uh, DAC inside of it, which is a really fantastic DAC. Some people say, well, the ESS Sabre, it's a little more analytical than I like. Um, the AK4490, when they're making decisions on how to turn digital bits into the stuff you hear, and it, they kind of air towards the musical. Um, it's got a volume knob, it's got a fantastic headphone amplifier inside of it, and again, it sells for $99. And that is a, that's another, it? that's it. That's um, not bad. Yeah, especially when you think like, um, you know, when you start getting into the crazy stuff, um, again, really, really fantastic piece of hardware. I've heard that and I'm amazed by what you can do for a hundred bucks. Yeah. If you want to start spending lots of money, the sky's the limit. I can probably find you a $25,000 DAC. I actually had one of those. Uh, Jim, let me ask you, Exactly what are you looking for? I mean, what, what kind of money are you planning to put into this project? Uh, what do you want out of your collection? The, the 99 sounds like a good, good price <laughs> to be going with that. I mean, it's, it's at work, I'm listening to it, so it's, but I, I listen all day. Mm -hmm. And yes, after the lossless, I'm hearing so much I had not heard for years since I actually listened to the CDs. It, it, does, a, it does make a difference when you, the first time you hear oh my gosh, that's what I've been missing. Mm -hmm. it, it is like a, a light switch gets turned on and you realize I want this for all the music that I listen to. Yeah. Uh, but I, I gotta ask you this, it's, are you willing to put in a little extra money and maybe get something, maybe not coplanar headphones because those are crazy expensive, but, but a nice set of headphones that will justify you getting a decent deck? Possibly, these I just got, I think they were 
they're like two hundred dollar headphones, so that's kind of yeah, it's yeah of the budget with it, and they do sound better. I had the the V six hundreds that I used mm-hmm. to have sounded great, but then they were getting where I was hearing limitations of the headphones, where I was getting static static or distortion with them. Oh, and now this new set, I'm definitely hearing a cleaner sound with it. Well, you know, at ninety to ninety nine dollars, it it would be used to getting a, a DAC just to see if it improves the quality of those headphones. I, I mean, I, it's a fun yeah. way to, I mean, a lot of places you can purchase these, you know, they'll give you a 30 day free trial. You can sit down, you know, put together a list of your 10 favorite songs, right? And then, you know, listen to that, listen to them normal use. You know, I would start with a, a Dragonfly a Black or a shit full of two and listen to it. You know, do I hear details I didn't hear before? Is the bass, you know, stronger and cleaner on this? Does it, you know, open up the sort of sense of the room or, or to give you more of the detail of the room? Because it kind of gets ridiculous when you start listening to music. And and this is really nerdly. It's on one level like, yeah, Bob Marley, AM radio, beat up pickup truck, epiphanal experience, right? Because it's Bob Marley and he's... That's an emotional response. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't yeah, say that on different. a family show, but it's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, and then you go to like, oh, FM. Wow, there's FM radio, and it's clear, and it's got a larger range. And hey, I've got stereo inside of this. And then you go to like, oh, you know, I've got a decent, you know, you, you sort of start building up. And as you as you get better, it's like, okay, 160 kilobit. It's not bad. It's Bob Marley. It's like, you know, the, the symbols kind of sound like bacon, but they're still, I think they're symbols. And then you get into like what you did. You go lossless. And it's like, I can hear the symbols. I can hear everything that's going on with the voices. And you start realizing, you know, the sound of the symbols been recorded or a sound of a drum hits, right? Because it's a very distinctive, you know, uh, snare drum. You hear the hit of the snare drum and you hear sort of the impact of the room around it and you get the full sense of what the recording engineers were trying to put together when they recorded it and when they mastered it. And so you can listen to it and hear everything that was going on, hopefully just like you were in the room with them, except better because of all the processing. But um, I think you're in the right path. I would start with an inexpensive DAC and headphone amp and and then just listen for like six months and then i'd start listening to other headphones just to see if you put one on and go oh this is amazing and then at that point you're probably doomed for the rest of your life <laughs> yeah so, uh, what i would suggest awesome. is uh, go to a show like ces and uh, drop by the audio pavilions. Ah, no, no, no. And Don't just go to put CES. on all the different headphones. They've been go hi-fi find, man. Find there. the local, but I mean, it's even amazing. Like they have amazing headphones now in Magnolia Hi-Fi, okay. like in the yeah. Magnolia yeah. stores inside of Best Buy, and those are all over the United States. Find a local, uh, you know, audio dealer that has stocks decent headphones. Go to the Can Jam gatherings or the HeadFi gatherings, where it's a whole bunch of headphone enthusiasts and people that make really, really nice headphones, and go listen to stuff, right? Because you know they they do those in you know Los Angeles, San. Francisco, Denver, I want to say Chicago and a whole bunch of other places. You know, it doesn't it might cost you 20 bucks, but you might get to hear everything from like headphones like these to $4,000 focal uh, utopias and everything in between and get a chance to listen to them with the music you love. And that's an amazing experience because you may listen to like I heard a $28,000 set of headphones at CES the same year that these came out. And I was like, wow, these were $300 when they first came out. And they got me like 98% of the way to the $28,000 headphones. And I was like, "That's that's <laughs> that was awesome. That's the vanishing asymptote. You can get closer yeah. and closer to affinity, but you never quite touch it. Uh, Jim, have, have we made your head spin enough yet? Because this was a lot of information. Oh, yes. That's yeah. definitely going to help me spend some money, it sounds like. But yeah, that's, a try. that's the audio world. Well, the trick is like change oh, yeah. one thing, listen to it for a while, and then try something else. Yeah, And just remember, you've heard it here from Patrick Norton, if you want good audio, you just need to buy a lot of shit. <laughs> I will do that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. We'll see you next time, and thanks for calling for a Call for Help. Thank you. Uh, uh, next week, we've got Jason Howell and Rich DeMuro. He is KTLA's tech guy on TV. If you've got a question for them... Here's how you ask. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. All right, there's probably some people who are wondering why I was holding a tomahawk, an axe type thing just a while ago. And that's because uh, when we were still not thinking that we were going to bring deadly weapons into the studio, we talked about preparing for disaster. This is a tool. It's a tool. Just like a rock. It's only yeah. a deadly weapon if it's you use it deadly, as one. It's a deadly, deadly rock. <laughs> now, I, I, thought, I thought what we could prob- possibly do is go through some of our go bags and some of our philosophies of putting together disaster preparedness kits. Yes. You want to do this? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and head over to the news desk and uh, 
see if we can court some disaster. All right. Now, Patrick, when you put together your go bag, uh, there's, there is a temptation to think about it as just a combination of technologies, just the, the gadgets and the gizmos that we, we think we want to carry. But you actually have to think about your go bag before you start putting it together. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest problems we run into. Um, people don't back up. And I'm rubbing my eyeballs here um, because I have, and, and we talk about backing up all the time on Techzilla, or on Techzilla, on right. Tech thing, Techzilla's gone. Um, and it's really simple, right? Your computer, that computer may be worth $1,500, $2,000. Mm -hmm. How much are the photos of your child you can't replace, your, your thesis, your bank data, your collection of whatever it is? I Irreplaceable. Mean, um, and so the thing is, is, is with natural disasters, and but I've had people like, you know, you're really kind of uptight about backing up. It's like, yeah, I am really uptight about backing up because my mom lives in a place that floods uh, a lot. On a, a yeah. lot. Uh, I have family that have been burned out of homes. I've got friends that live in Southern California where wildfires apparently just like to wipe out whole neighborhoods every mm -hmm. couple of years because they can. Uh, I live in earthquake territory where at some point, in theory, the ground's going to shake and my house is going to fall down, which is something I'm really thrilled about thinking about and explaining to my children after it happens. Um, and, you know, we, of course, have recently had a whole bunch of hot, steamy hurricane action stomping all over uh, Houston and Florida. And the time you start preparing for a disaster is not when the Weather Channel goes, you know, we got a really amazing cyclonic action. It looks like it's going to throw a hurricane off the coast of wherever you live, and all hell's going to break loose. Or, you know, the time to start backing up your data is not after the earthquake because, this, you know, it's probably not going to work, as stupid as that sounds. So you want to do things like back up your computer now, back up your data offline, three, two, one, three copies of your data on two different mediums, at least one off-site. And I bring all of that up because... You know, by the time there is a natural disaster, all of the stores are going to be sold out. If you've never right. been in a place that has been hammered by a hurricane, let me explain. All hell breaks loose. As all hell is beginning to break loose for days before that, people panic and they buy all of the water, all of the canned food. And there's like, it's really cool. The, one of the funnest things you can do just as a surreal experience is to watch a, a, a supermarket empty before a hurricane. Yeah, that, that was one of the things, things I saw when I was uh, down in South America during mm -hmm. a disaster that you would go into a store and it's literally just the stuff on the ground. Yeah. And people are still picking up the stuff off the ground because they're like, well, I need to get something. Yeah, they buy all of the things they might actually eat. Yeah. And then they buy all the things they might actually eat if they're desperate. Then they buy all the things that might actually be trade to something yeah. that they might want to eat. And then they buy everything that's left. Yeah. You know, because everybody needs to buy a, a case of, you know, roach repellent right before a hurricane when the roaches are all going to drown. But I literally watched them and that's the reaction. Well, it was the only thing left and I drove out here. Yeah. So don't wait. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Buying the case of roach repellent before the hurricane drowns all the roaches. So there is an upside, I guess. That, let's, well, now let's get past the upside okay. and actually start looking. This is a, uh, you assembled a go bag and I've got a go bag. This is actually a template that I've had for a while of things that I, I keep in my <laughs> Somebody car. Somebody walked off with my go bag. Your, <laughs> is it under here? Someone, your go bag oh, is, there it is. is gone. Uh, and the whole idea is I need something that can keep me alive after a disaster. And typically, this will be in my car, so I'm assuming I have my <coughs> car to, to get away from the immediate disaster. But then it has to keep me alive and safe for maybe a week or so. Yeah. I have a slightly different approach. Okay, Because there's, there's, I, I have a family of four. Ah. And the, the most likely disaster to happen here in the Bay Area is an earthquake. And there is no, because a friend of mine was like, you know, we're going to go to our parents' place in Grass Valley because they have a, you know, a cabin there. We can stay. And I'm like, wait a minute. So July 4th weekend, when everybody knows July 4th weekend is coming, it takes four hours to get from San Francisco to the Carquinez Bridge, which is like 45 miles away. This is a drive that normally takes like an hour. So you're telling me after the big one hits, and the streets of, of downtown San Francisco are under five feet of glass. It's popped off all of the giant buildings and the water mains are broken and the gas doesn't work and everything's collapsed and people are panicking and digging their neighbors out and doing whatever else they do after a giant earthquake. You're gonna drive, what, for what? Spend three or four days driving yeah. to your parents' house? Can you even get gasoline? Do all the, you know, will there be electricity? Is your gas tank full? So there's preparedness that goes into being yeah. prepared. Yeah. yeah. Now you have a family of four. I actually have a family of fifteen. I live with fourteen others. Oh my goodness. But I don't really like them, so it's this is just. This is <laughs> yeah. Just see, for me. for me, my bag is about. My bag started with, and it's funny. I'm glad we did this because I hadn't checked like the bag right. I keep the right. stuff in. Because what I do is my my issue is like I worked in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. My family is in the East Bay. What is it going to take me? You know, and what I really needed to add to the kit that I didn't have was a kayak 
or a folding so tote. So this is your go home bag. This is my go home Got bag. Because 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 the bug out bag for my family basically looks like we're going to go camping, you know, in the middle of nowhere for several days. <laughs> uh, because when you have four people, it just and and a couple of them are small, things just get complicated. Right. So, you know, in terms of we're kind of sheltering in place unless the island goes underwater, in which case I don't really want to think or talk about that because we got a boat. Um, but, you know, you should start. Should we start unpacking? Yeah, let's start. By, I want to start with food just because there is a little thing that we have to start off here so that we can finish before the show's over. Uh, now, I know this is kind of overreacting and I know there's going to be people out there who are going to laugh at me, but uh, all of the go bags I've ever assembled, I actually do include uh, MREs. Which are known as meals rejected by everyone. <laughs> uh, they are, they're not great, but what I found is that they contain so many calories per each one mm -hmm. of these. That, and they have such a long shelf life that they are actually quite good in a disaster yes. pack. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and open this one up right here. <laughs> because uh, if you've never had the MRE experience. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, this uh, Grape jelly, because, you know... You want to do that. Each one of these is going to contain about 12 to 1300 calories, which is enough for a person. Technically, we should have about 2000, about 2500 calories per day to, to maintain our weight. But if it's a disaster, it's a cookie. Yeah, you got to be thinking that you're going to be uh, you're oh, gonna, yeah. oh, yeah, the uh, the super cookie. That That is a cookie that will survive a nuclear war. Yeah, whether or not you can actually chew it is an entirely different question. Uh, yeah, chewing is entirely optional. You just need to get some protein and carbs into you. Uh, there's always a couple of things. Now, this is what people think of when they think of the MREs. This is the, uh, the self-heating meal. So the whole idea with this, and actually I have to open this up and grab which some water. Which meal did you open, by the way? Uh, this is I, some sort of stew, uh, which is fun because when you order these meals, Mexican you don't really get to style choose chicken what you want. stew. Oh, see, we're gonna be eating good tonight, in our in our <laughs> mock disaster. No, I'm gonna be eating my pro bars. Oh, there we go. Okay. Also, I carry three liters of water because the human body needs at minimum one liter of water a day. Mm -hmm. Preferably two liters. Three liters is actually what is the norm. But if again, if you're in an emergency, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have that. It doesn't take that much. This is actually a water-activated heater. Now, this is a combination of magnesium, really finely powdered magnesium, iron, and salt. NaCl. Really table salt. fun to play with in fires. Yes. Wear safety goggles. If you blow your eyes out, it's not my fault. Exactly. <laughs> uh, now, the whole idea is once you add water, what's going right. to happen is it starts an exothermic reaction. The uh, the magnesium and the iron actually combine. Mm -hmm and they form millions of tiny little batteries, and it's, these batteries are shorting out. It's basically like thermite, but on a much smaller scale. Yeah, it's thermite, but Instead of but, burning but a hole fun. through the top of your yeah. hard drive, it's just, you know, It's, it's just like thermite, meal. except there's not so much death and screaming and disaster. Always a big plus. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually going to get really, really hot, which is why I asked to bring out those, these blotters, because this actually could start a fire in the studio, which will be fun when we have all our visitors here from Australia. <laughs> uh, now, what was this again? Mexican something? Mexican... Stew, chicken stew, Ch chicken, chicken knee stew, Mexican style chicken stew. All right, so it's also gonna... marked as new, 2015. Uh, yes, uh, that's the other thing. When you buy these things, they're going to cost about fourteen dollars each or so. Uh, they're good for about five to six years, so mm -hmm. they have a fantastically long shelf life. Although I am having to recycle the ones from the, the very oldest go bags that I have. There's a little fill line on these packs, right here. And that's what you fill this thing up to. Uh, do not overfill it because otherwise it gets exciting. Th the reaction will go out of control. Yeah. And instead of cooking your meal, you burn a hole through the table. Uh, Always awkward. And uh, yeah, and also <laughs> Leo about the table. That. Sorry, Leo. So we just pour a little bit of water in there. Oh, oh, okay. And all over the table. And I way overfilled it. So yeah, we are gonna have fire. And then you just drop this thing down, close this up. And then we're just going to slosh this gently back and forth. We just kind of want to introduce the water to all the magnesium. Why are you pointing the open end of the bag at me? I know. <laughs> can you point that at your laptop? Let's like, go over that way. Okay. This and is then, why we have the tomahawk. <laughs> we put this back into its little cardboard pouch box thingy. And uh, in about 15 minutes, we should have a, a fully cooked meal. Wouldn't that be exciting? I'm slightly terrified, to be perfectly honest with you. It's like eating a bar of salt. <laughs> <laughs> so get excited because this is going to be delish. Now, uh, again, you know, one of these things is it's enough to keep you going. You're going to lose weight over seven days or so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that thing is going to leak everywhere. It might actually start to steam. Don't worry. This is, perfectly this normal. is, all, this is all perfectly normal. Uh, now, uh, 
you probably don't carry any MREs in your bag, right? No, I actually, uh, I discovered uh, racing down in Baja that I can live indefinitely on these things called Pro Bars, which are like the Those only, yeah. yeah, it's like a, a, it's like an oatmeal cookie. I don't know how to describe it. They took fruit, they took oatmeal, they took things that people normally hate to eat, and it's just enough sugar that it actually tastes good, but it doesn't make me want to vomit. Um, so I literally have about, let's see, there's three, six, it's about 1,200 calories worth of Pro Bars in here. And you should have noticed that a lot of our uh, language around food for disaster preparedness is just to the point of vomit. And that's that's actually true because well, these this all has to have long tasty. shelf life. I also usually have a roll of Oreos because nothing makes me happier than Oreos. Uh, yeah, I carry a lot of granola Chewy bars. bars. Uh, it, actually, this is something that uh, one of my, uh, my marathon friends has told me, which is uh, if you are trying to get away from a disaster, mm -hmm. don't think of it as a meal, like three meals or one big no. meal a day. It's easier to snack a little bit. Your body actually uses it more efficiently than having a big meal and then trying to digest it. Yeah, my, in my case, my goal is to keep moving until I get to the house. And, right. And, and then I can probably deal with all the nightmare at the house. Um, I actually keep uh, a really simple, people talk about space blankets, which I hate, <laughs> um, because they don't do a particularly good job keeping you warm and they don't do a particularly good job keeping you dry. Um, but a company called Survival Outdoors Longer or Soul um, the coolest thing I've ever seen is actually uh, by a fellow by the name of Cummerfelt, and he taught uh, survival for the Air Force for like three decades, uh, and he is the man. And uh, But he basically sells what amounts to sort of a giant garbage bag yeah. made out of six mil plastic. And this is basically the same idea. This is big enough so I can fit like me and one of my kids inside of it, but it's the only version of the the thermal bag that I actually feel is worth carrying, the, the Mylar Space Emergency Blankets. And it's basically a giant plastic sleeping bag that does two things. Um, yeah, it will reflect some heat, but mostly it will keep me dry and I can fit mm -hmm. myself. And if I've got one of my kids with me, one of my kids inside of it to keep all of us warm. You know, I, get, I get asked about uh, disaster equipment and the thing that I always tell people who are trying to assemble their bug out bag for the first time is the biggest enemy you have if you are bugging out of an area is actually exposure. Yeah, yeah, that's the elements are going to kill yeah. you. And actually, here you go. I uh, I have one of those little solar blankets that you hate so much just because it's so small. I, yeah, I, I, I bought like a 10 pack of these things. I, I hide mean, them everywhere. I also have zip ties and uh, somewhere in here should be a roll of Gorilla Tape because it's amazing what you can do with those uh, in times of trauma. Great minds. But, <laughs> go, I yeah, got to have the zip ties. They're super effective. Also, I always carry a bunch of, zi of like Ziploc bags and just garbage bags. There you go. Yeah. These Literally everything inside so, here is so, so useful for, for things you can't even think of. Well, yet. the other thing, it will keep your iPhone dry. It will keep an iPad dry. You can use your, or any type of, of, of smartphone you can actually use physically inside one of those. Right. Um, you know, they are the worst possible scenario for water carrying, but they will help you carry a couple pints of water. Yeah. I don't yeah. recommend it, but if you're desperate, they'll work. Um, uh, also, you've, you've got a first aid kit, something for basic injuries, right? I have uh, super glue, super glue, Gorilla works. tape, yeah. band aids, uh, Neosporin, and that's pretty much all I carry. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I'm feeling, you know, I have a trauma bag that I probably should put in this, but the trauma bag is designed to deal with people who are like bleeding out and or you know, heavily close to death. Uh, I, I, this is sort of a, a nod to comfort, but I always carry moist towelettes in my first aid kit. And then I also have this. You get these so many times at conferences. I always throw one uh, bottle of, of waterless cleanser, although this is waterless cleanser with glitter. So it's, you know, it's a fun emergency. Yeah, you know. We have a. Yeah. You can't have an emergency without a little bit of glitter. Oh my goodness. I, one of the reasons I was really glad we did this today is I discovered that I had loaned my uh, ah. water purification kit to a buddy uh, who never brought it back. Boom. Yes. How about that? We both have the Sawyer. Uh, this is about 20 bucks. I, I think we both basically have the same kit. Yeah. And the whole idea is this is going to come with a little inflatable bladder. So you fill this thing up, it screws on to this, and then you just provide pressure and it will squirt through the filter that's in here. Mm -hmm. This is supposedly good for up to 100,000 gallons of filtering, although I found that it kind of jams up after 100, so you, you have to you reverse to it. it. They have a flushing yeah. kit, There's and almost kit. all of the modern ones have some kind of flushing kit yeah. uh, or advise you to sort of blow backwards through it to blow the stuff out. But yeah, the interesting thing for me about these is it's one of the smallest kits you can get, um, and I carry, I have multiple bags. These will actually fit on any kind of 20 ounce water bottle. Yep. So what I would do is rather than using these, I would fill a water bottle 
and then fill these with my clean water. But, and I would, you know, if you're in a place that has running water, fill your water bottles before you leave that place. Right. Uh, I will say one thing, and yes, I know there's people in the audience who are thinking about this. This will filter like 99.99% .99 of bacteria and microorganisms. It will not remove salt. So you cannot put salt water into this and then expect to get clean water out, which also means no, no, no. You cannot use it to filter your own pee. Well, you can filter your own pee, but it's still mostly going to be salt. pee. Yeah. <laughs> You've, yeah, your, your pee was sterile anyway, so there's not a whole lot of microorganisms in there unless you've done something bad. Now, okay, so we've got, we've got water. Again, mm -hmm. one, one liter of water a day is minimum. That's yes. just to keep you alive. If you're gonna be moving, and we're moving, two liters is what you're really thinking. Yeah, I mean, I've, basically, I've, I can roll three liters plus whatever other water bottle I'm carrying with me before I go, and right. I would fill that before I left wherever I was. Yeah, um, yeah and like you, uh, wipes are good for yep cleaning yourself and uh, also for relieving yourself. Yeah, and also if you've seen the Book of Eli, they're really good for trade. It's a movie thing. Know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, this is something that I've learned over the years. Uh, I used to carry a lot of like camping line. I've replaced it with uh, rubber tubing, silicon tubing. Hmm. This is super, super effective. You can use this in medical emergencies to splint or to, uh, to tie off if, if you've got an injury. But it's also good if you like, for example, if I wanted to stretch this between branches and then I'd hang a blanket over it and make a makeshift shelter. I feel so old school, I've just got paracord in here. Yeah, paracord, no, paracord is fantastic. But the reason why I like this is this is also really good for like siphoning gas out of cars. Oh, I like that. If you need fuel. <laughs> Not that I would ever do that. Unless there was an emergency. You know, if someone abandons their car, yeah. is it okay to punch a Nazi in the face? Yes! <laughs> Call <laughs> that. I love to see this is what it means to be a pro broadcaster. Uh, I always carry a little, little something, typically yes. one change of clothing. Because if you get wet, uh, again, we go back to the exposure problem. I'm not smart enough to carry one thing of clothing, but I always have, because of, it's really funny here, like most of the United States, you have uh, weather. Like it gets cold in the winter, it gets mm -hmm. hot in the summer, and it changes a lot in between. We have two seasons here in California. We have the dry season and the wet season, and the wet season also happens to be the cold season. Right. Um, so I try to always have, um, you know, I basically always have a fleece and some kind of waterproof jacket. Right, yeah, so um, this jacket's waterproof, and you can layer it. Yeah. Uh, I carry one change of undergarments. I will typically carry uh, two changes of socks, because those are typically the ones that are gonna get mm -hmm. wet the most. Uh, and then, you know, if I'm only doing it for a week, that should be enough. Now, uh, how about, we actually start looking at some of the tech, because this is a lot of food and water and medical supplies. There are some pieces of tech that I do enjoy carrying with me. Uh, this is actually a dry case. <laughs> you could do this with a plastic bag. A Ziploc bag works just fine. But this is actually one of these units that was designed to work with your tech, specifically your phone. Uh, and uh, it, this, I've actually used these to go like scuba diving with a phone before. Mm -hmm. So I know they work underwater. Uh, if, if you are bugging out, your electronic device is one right. of the most useful things that you're going to carry with you. And, and I actually have mine preset. Anytime I go into a new area, I download the offline maps into the phone. If there is a problem... So I just have all 50 states already downloaded onto my phone. There you go. I, That's I, I have a Navigon application and another application. I have a basically a topographic map for the entire western 50 states, and then uh, I keep the, the street maps for the entire United States in my phone. Right, right. Um, I used to carry a GPS with me, mm -hmm. and that was great because it runs on just any kind of power I can give to it. But the detail that I can get off of a phone mm -hmm. with the GPS enabled, even if I have no cellular service because everything's on the phone itself, it's fantastic. I mean, that is probably your best survival tool. Uh-oh, what's this? External batteries. Oh, yeah, okay, wait. I got, I got some of those in here. <laughs> this, this is mine. Which one did you get? Uh, this is one I've been carrying around that, that came out of the hack house for, for uh, most of my stuff that I bought is Anchor. Yeah, this is an anchor as well. This yeah. is a 26,000 milliamp hour. Um, I mean, combined with my phone, if I turn off my Wi-Fi, turn off the radio, and mm -hmm. only turn on the GPS when I need it, this will actually keep my phone charged for, I think it was eight weeks. Uh, wow. This is probably overkill, but it also allows me to charge up anything else that I might need at that given time. Yeah, it's better to actually have too much power in case you do, you know, one, screw up and leave something running in the background that runs your phone down like a GPS, uh, or two, uh, 
start getting long phone conversations or pinging cell towers that don't exist. Is this a solar kit or binoculars? Oh, maybe a little of everything. <laughs> uh, what I like about this bag is I can actually open it from the bottom as well. I'm just not using that right now. So this is the solar kit. So actually not that useful. Believe it or not, if you're yeah. bugging out, this is not super useful. What I do like about this though is I can actually, I can hang this off the back of my bag. So it could be charging a little bit as I, as I move and it has this. This is a waterproof pouch oh, that nice. you can enclose, so you could actually put your device in here and it will mm -hmm. charge off. It's got an internal 10,000 milliamp battery that gets charged by the solar panel. Uh, this is sort of, if you're out for an extended period mm -hmm. of time, this is a way to at least have a way to Things recharge Things have gone fully sideways and yeah. you're spending weeks out in the hills. This is the, yeah, everything is blown up kit. <laughs> uh, now, do you have any sort of emergency radio or lighting? I sometimes do. I kind of stopped carrying them for a while. Yeah, this I, I've had this forever. In fact, they've discontinued this. This is an, yeah. e, an Eaton FR300. It's, it's a crank, but it's actually got four sources of power. So I can run this off of standard alkali batteries. It's got mm -hmm. a LiPo battery in there. And I can also use the crank or the external battery. And for that, it gives me, you know, sort of like the light, the flasher, and more importantly, the radio. So I get right. AM, FM, plus all the weather channels. This is a good way to make sure that you actually know what's going on during the disaster. I think it's smart to have a radio. I, my problem is that my kids always find the ones with the handles, yeah. and then they just disappear with them. And they destroy the handles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't give me a lot of hope that it's going to hold up. Eton makes actually pretty good gear, and they do a really amazing lineup of right. uh, handheld chargers. And, and they've got everything from about $20 all the way up to $150. Mm -hmm. You just find the one that works for you. Uh, what I like about this is this actually has an output so I could charge my phone or the battery if I wanted to sit there and crank for days. A day, yeah. <laughs> so, duh. I'm Anything that involves that. cranking to charge things probably takes longer and is more frustrating than you want to deal with, but it is an option. Uh, there is a maxim that preppers use, and that is if you have two, you have one. If you have one, you have none. Which is why you have solar and a crank and the batteries. And also my phone and then this thing. Now, this is, I, I, have, I actually bought a bunch of these things. They've been all over. They'll work I've anywhere. I've seen these. Yeah, they're emergency phones. They work off AA batteries. Now the cool thing about this is even if you don't have a SIM, mm -hmm. you can turn this thing on and it will still make emergency calls. Whether or not anyone will answer. Yeah, if everyone's dead, then it's probably kind of redundant. But it's incredibly light. It's in a waterproof case, and this is this is your emergency phone. I mean, it will connect to any GSM system. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a little Energizer AA battery <laughs> inside of there. I should probably check that. It might have turned into powder by now. There's, this should be good. No, it should say on the outside. Yeah, it's, I think it's a lithium. It's a yeah. No, it's, it's, it's okay. lithium. Okay. 03, 2027. I think you got a few years left on this one. Now. I gotta ask you, what do you have for flame? Because at some point you're gonna need to start a fire. I don't do flame. You don't? In this bag, because so the whole point of my bag is to get me back through an urban environment True. to my house. Uh, and in the most likely emergency, which as we discussed is an earthquake, uh, the most likely thing to happen when creating a flame is that I blow somebody else's house up or light somebody's gas line on fire. So, you know, I have a lighter that I keep in my bag normally for heat shrink. <laughs> You know, there's nothing wrong with the butane torch. I don't know if that's the ideal thing for lighting things on fire. Probably not. I don't get into fights with people holding butane torches <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, in my case, um, the likelihood, I, nothing I have needs to be cooked. Nothing I have needs to be boiled. Nothing I have. There is, there is no reason for me to light a fire unless I'm freezing. And if I'm freezing, I probably need to actually keep moving and find a better place to bunker down. I understand. Yeah, so, I get and that. it's also, again, it's it's you know, it's the Bay Area. Like oh, it's 32 degrees, and people are like, it's so cold. Life sucks. I don't have a down coat. And I'm like, I, I don't think I'm gonna need to to create a flame, but I just really like fire. <laughs> there you have it. All right. Okay. Tools. Tools. Because tool now. I, I I used to in my early go bags. I had way too many tools. Now I've kind of reduced it to this mini Leatherman, this mini multi-tool. Yeah, you do the same thing. Uh, you're not going to be assembling anything while you're running, so it's really just something that... fixing things. Fixing, yeah. Fixing a couple things, cutting zip ties. Yeah. Uh, that's what you need. And, and you know, yeah. a multi, any, any sort of multi-tool will do that. I have a Leatherman Skeletool that basically is on me 24-7, 365 or near me. Um, and I have a spare, uh, a spare Leatherman that goes in the bag. I mean, basically what I have, everything I have fits into the bag that I normally carry to work. Because, you know, since I run my life out of my backpack, it's not like I'm going to, you know, dump 
my right. work backpack to to mm -hmm. to get home. Um, you know, I also keep a ridiculous knife, uh, not for self-defense, but because it's actually really useful to be able to cut things. Or if you've had conversations with people who have had to get out of environments that have been through an earthquake, uh, yeah. you know, this is basically a knife that is thick enough where I can use it as a pry bar. Um, Speaking of pry bars, you've told me that I shouldn't be carrying this. I've always included a pry bar, a crowbar, in every bug out bag. I've, I, and you, I think I know. I think they're incredibly useful, especially if you've ever talked to somebody who has had to like break open a door to yeah. get into their house mm -hmm. or out of an office in an earthquake. You have to be careful. I don't think in an earthquake situation they're going to give you much crap in California, but if that could be considered burglary tools, you might <sighs> end up in trouble. For example, this knife, yeah. you know. Uh, I'm gonna try not to make any crocodile Dundee jokes because of of the young people. That's this not knife, a knife. If, if, this yeah, but if life. if I mount this knife, this like if I put this knife in my bag, I could probably be arrested for it being yeah. concealed in my bag. Yep. If I'm wearing it on my hip or if it is duct taped to um, the strap on my bag, I am fine. So you know, it's it's you know it's something to think about before you start stuffing things into a bag. A friend of mine's like, well, I keep a pistol at the office. I'm like, well, okay, but you know, it's probably going to be taken away from you the first time you run into a police checkpoint. And people, you know, do with that what you will. Move to another state if you have to, but you know, understand what the laws are and what yeah. qualifies. Uh, as legal or illegal in terms of, of transport. I need a weapon to keep myself safe. I get it, man. We've all been there. We've all wanted to have a stick to beat somebody half to death with. Just make sure you're not going to end up in prison because... <laughs> Yeah, actually, crowbars are really effective in self-defense. I prefer longer sticks um, because I like to be farther I've, away. I've watched Walking Dead. Yeah. I learn all my tips from zombie <laughs> movies for survival. Thank you. <laughs> you know, um, the best plan is to not get into a conflict. Precisely. Um, Precisely. Because there's nothing worse than finding out that the skinhead Nazi you punched in the face has seven of his best friends around the corner. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it hurts to learn that lesson. Yes, it does. Uh, especially if there's no actual services to you know, help you at that point. Now, the, the thing is, when you're putting together a, a go bag, uh, I always choose the bag last because mm -hmm. I, I look at the stuff that I might be collecting. I never pack it to the gills because I'm assuming that as I'm going, I'm going to be collecting anything I can <laughs> to, to help me in my endeavor to stay alive. E, what's in my inventory? And let's look for... <laughs> exactly. And then I was eaten by a... What was a Gru? I, I get yeah. eaten by a Gru. That's, a Gru eats your face. You have yeah. died of dysentery. That's the one from Oregon Trail. <laughs> no, so I, I think what Patrick and I are saying is that, uh, yes, definitely put some thought into putting together your go bag, uh, wherever you are. It's always a good yeah. thing to have something that's ready to go. And it doesn't have to be, there's a nuclear war and I need a bug out bag. It, it can just be, look, I want to well, be prepared. Yeah, I want to be able to, what, what's going to happen if I have to walk for 18 hours yeah. to get back to my house? Because I have to go down to another bridge or if I have to walk all the way down to San Jose around the entire bay to get back to my house, you know, what's likely to be useful? You know, things that will prevent you from dying of exposure, things that will help you get water, enough food to keep your caloric in Take. Don't assume you'll be able to buy or find anything. Don't carry anything that's likely to end up pissing off the local police or sheriff's office and end up with your ass arrested, right. taking up valuable sources that could be used for more dangerous people. Um, so be use your common sense. Oh, oh I, I shouldn't have said that. I, there's nothing wrong with common sense. I just don't know if it's always the best thing to rely on based on the decisions I see people make every day. Oh, I, I, there was a lot of people driving Teslas with the dotted line going through the center of the Tesla because they couldn't decide if they wanted to be the left or the right. And so I'm That's just, just being cautious, Patrick. I like yeah. that. <laughs> now, folks, if you want to see more bug out bag disaster preparedness, <laughs> you're going to want to watch it. I think it's in three weeks we've got a know-how coming up. We're covering exactly this. And we're kind of approaching it from the maker DIY side. So we're going to be MacGyvering some stuff. They're going to be making tomahawks out of railroad spikes <laughs> with crazy glue, duct tape, and anger. It's, it's what you do, it's what you do. Now, coming up, we got the mailbag. We got some questions we need to answer, and we have a meal that we have to eat. <laughs> a meal that is, in theory, ready to eat. It's, it's wait. Oh, wow, that's hot. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, it's melting things. Woo, look, I got a little, st oh. Okay, here, that's, you, you don't touch that. That's I flipped new. pizzas for five years. I can't feel anything <sighs> in my hands anymore. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a gander over to the corner with Jason Howell because he's got a disaster preparedness tip just for you. What happens if all you've got is your phone, a charger, and a nine volt battery?
Natural disasters like Hurricanes Harvey and Irma have reminded us just how many of the things we take for granted and how those can be taken away in an instant. Power, for example, becomes a luxury in situations like these, and that has dramatic consequences. Obviously, you can't keep your food from going bad, you can't keep the heat and the lights on, and you can't charge your phone. Now, I know that last one seems far less significant than the rest of those examples, but when that phone is quite literally your only way of communicating with those who might rescue you or care for you, a powered phone becomes critical. So today, I'm going to show you how you can take a few things that you already have lying around the house to make your own phone charger if you need one. For this, you're going to need a car charger for your phone, a paper clip, a roll of tape, and a 9-volt battery. Now, the metal button on the car charger, on the tip of the car charger, is the positive end. So we'll go ahead and drop that into the positive pull on the 9-volt battery. Now, I'm going to hold it there and attach the paper clip to the negative pull on the 9-volt battery and then also to the side metal piece that's hanging out of the side of the car charger plug. This completes the circuit. And once I plug in my phone into this little contraption, you can see right there the charging icon is displayed. It's charging. Now we can use the tape that we have here uh, to keep it all secured so that we don't have to hold it awkwardly for hours in place. And voila, my phone is charging with a 9-volt battery. But how quickly? Well, my Pixel XL is capable of fast charge, of course. Using an Android app called Ampere, I can measure the charge that's being sent to my phone. When my Pixel XL is plugged into the fast charge wall brick, under normal circumstances, Ampere shows that it gets between 1,500 to 2,400 milliamps of charge. Now, I won't get that with a 9-volt battery, so that means a slower charge. But when I test the 9-volt battery here, I get anywhere between 700 to 1,400 milliamps. That's not too bad for a makeshift charger. And I would also advise keeping the phone powered off while you're charging for the quickest speed. Now, I hope you never find yourself in need of something like this, but if you do, hopefully this tip will come to mind. It's really easy to do. I'm Jason Howell, and you can find me on Tech News Today and All About Android here on twit.tv. And we are back. And Patrick, you have found uh, what I would say is the most important part of any disaster preparedness pack, that's the cookies. If you don't have the cookies, yes. you, you can't survive a disaster. And we've also discovered that I still can't throw worth of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's only for the live viewers. They saw something very uh, incredible. Yeah, yet another international incident I've been part of. Uh, now, um, but before we move on, though, uh, we did promise to... In yeah, you promised. I'm just suffering this. along with you. So, I mean, this is actually quite hot. This this is actually a hot meal. It is a hot meal. Uh, it does get incredibly hot. Um, we have dripped whatever that is all over the place. Magnesium juice. In theory, oh. you need no tools to open this. Right, and in theory, this should taste better than what that bag smelled like because that was just right. the chemical heat. Yeah, we were smelling the chemical reaction, not the delicious chicken-style Mexican stew. 5197 space 2A space P-248-1246. Which, by the way, means that this thing will last for six years. And any food that lasts six years has got to be delicious. Right? That's how that works. Hey, man. All right, pour it Nobody in. Nobody makes fun of got. spam when I'm in the room. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That uh, looks like chicken chunks. Uh, yeah. That's, um... Actually, it smells pretty good. It's just like mom used to make. <laughs> My mom didn't like cooking. All right, that's for you. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna oh, take. I get the big I'm gonna take a chicken chunk. There you go, and the rest of it's for you. It actually, looks like chicken, not processed chicken. This is good. Mm. You weren't kidding about the salt. Actually, that's not bad. But yeah, that is a ton of salt. Well, I guess you need that to make it uh, uh, last as long Here, as it I'll does. I'll finish it off for you. All right. <laughs> I hate that lunch. So, folks, MREs are actually not that nasty. If you, you don't know, mind salt. you've had one. That's true. And the other one is like macaroni there's, and bologna. There's a whole bunch of people who serve right now going like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, MREs uh, have one or two, just don't live on them. Let's go ahead and jump while Patrick still eats the MRE into the mailbag. Got the little magical process over here. Uh, normally this has something in it that we can eat. Oh, yeah, we, we could eat that. This is a, a, a monkey pox. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I uh, have I'm monkey assuming pox that's important. Squeeze me. And uh, here, why don't you take that one? <laughs> uh, 
the, the twit staff is a very strange, strange experience. Why don't you go ahead and take this one, and World's I'll take this one, and uh, why don't you go ahead and lead off? I have a beautiful 4K display of the Windows 10 system. It's from Ron. He says, it looks great. The video card is a Radeon R7 200 with two gigabytes of memory, and the resolution is set at 3840 by 2160. The computer uses an i7 processor and has 20 gigabytes of memory. Would a newer video card with six gigabytes of memory improve the display? I am not much of a gamer. Okay, great information. First of all, we know he's not a gamer, so that part is, yeah. he's really looking for display quality. He just wants it to be a better picture. He wants it to be a, a little bit more solid. He does doesn't really need mm -hmm. the highest frame rate pro possible. I get this question a lot. They, the people ask me, I, I have X computer, right. and I want to run a 4K monitor. Does that mean I have to buy some exotic hardware? And the answer is, at first, no. Every modern computer that you're going to buy today right. will support a 4K display. Or should. Or should display, uh, support a 4K display. But the question that he wanted to know is, would it improve the quality of the image at all? And that's, that's not as, as easy to answer. Yeah, I mean, what you're basically talking about here is an incredibly inexpensive GPU that exists to put inside of systems where they basically need a GPU, they need discrete graphics to connect to a monitor because they don't have discrete graphics on the motherboard or in the chip. Um, you know, my, my first thought is like, no, if it works and you have no issues with the color, you're probably done because what you're doing is, you know, 2D rendering is basically, you know, the there's just there's no there there anymore there's no it's not like yeah. back like you know 25 years ago you could be like you know i can out type my gpu that doesn't happen anymore mm -hmm. so as long as your 4k if you have the actual correct resolution on your 4k display and you know it is working properly you should be fine yeah, yeah. You know, mostly i want to know how you got 20 gigabytes of ram <laughs> exactly <laughs> no, the, the, the one thing i will say that is if you are doing any kind of application mm -hmm. where you start to see frame shearing right then okay, maybe, maybe the GPU is not holding up and maybe you're yeah. actually using a 3D application that you don't know you're using. And that's where things get more interesting right. because for example, if you start using applications like Photoshop, it will take advantage of a GPU to accelerate any of a number of processes inside of the application. In that case, you may actually want to get a 3D GPU, but generally speaking, you know what? You're not doing 3D games. You have no interest in 3D games. Everything works perfectly. Don't fix it. Yeah. Uh, the other question there is about the memory. How much memory does he actually need? And, you know, unless you're doing video editing or something that requires right. huge amounts of memory, which he's not, and he's not mm -hmm. even gaming, that's, no, that's not really yeah. something. You could get away with eight gigabytes, honestly. Yeah. I mean, well, at this point, to. he's talking about, like, his, he's got two gigabytes. I, I'm kind of, it's, it's funny, because I want to do the math, because in theory, a frame buffer for 4K right. shouldn't fit inside of two gigabytes of memory. But again, if it looks good to you, and you're not having issues, and you're not seeing tearing, and there's no color problems, and most importantly, you are actually displaying the correct native resolution, you're done. Now, so. if the reason for you answer, asking this question is because you want to upgrade your hardware, and right now someone is listening, uh, just cut to this part and say, Yes, you do need to buy a new graphics card in order for this to work. Otherwise, your computer will spontaneously combust and burn down your house. Unfortunately, though, the whole Bitcoin mining cost hasn't dropped fast enough and hard enough yet for the price of GPUs to return back to normal because there's still people who are, there have been so many people hoovering them up yep. for the last year or two. There you go. That, there's your advice. All right, we got one more. I actually have one from Greg from San Diego. And Greg wants to ask, I do a lot of video editing, but my laptop's processor can't handle the large video files coming to a grinding halt. Ouch. I want to get a desktop, good, good, good thinking, with a good processor. What do you recommend as far as the processor I should get and is 12 gigs of RAM enough? Okay, <laughs> good question and actually this strikes close to home because I do carry a laptop with mm -hmm. me when I have to do jobs on the go but I always prefer to edit on my desktop just because it is far more capable, even though it's way older than you any You don't like sitting there watching the swirly? Yeah, exactly. Well, because a lot of laptops are gonna be, they're gonna be thermally constrained. Right. Even if you've got the raging CPU in there with a great GPU, at some point it's gonna be generating more heat than it can dissipate and it throttles everything down. Which keeps you from melting down the processor, but also Which is good. slows down the process of rendering. Um, so working this kind of backwards, um, if you're building a desktop, the uh, the the Ambi's Radeon processors right now are amazing. The Threadripper, uh, oh. the Threadripper is overkill for most people. Yeah. Uh, but Still. A, uh, you know, a 1700 is an amazing processor right now, and for the money, it gives you way more core action than an Intel processor at the same price. Um, in terms of memory, if you're doing 1080p editing, 16 gigabytes is a start. 32 gigabytes would be better. Uh, but again, like I really like the AMD Ryzen, uh, you know, the 1500X, mm -hmm. the 
300X parts. Yeah, I mean, eight cores, three giga, yeah. I mean, this is a ridiculous processor. You know, eight cores, 16 threads, $299. Um, if you want to do overclocking, that's fine. All of the AMD processors are unlocked, but not all of the motherboards are unlocked, and that gets into a really right. geeky conversation really quickly. And the other part of this uh, equation is that he didn't mention which editing suite he's using, because that actually does matter if you've got an older editing suite. Like, I'm mm -hmm. still actually using Adobe Premiere 5, just because I don't have to subscribe, and it right. does most everything I needed to do. But the, the CUDA support on that is really, it's basic. It, it doesn't do a whole lot. A, a great GPU doesn't really help me. If you're using Creative Suite, the, the new right. one, or any of the newer editing softwares, it will absolutely take advantage of the GPU and a more advanced CPU. It will, but it's still, you know, when you look at Premiere especially, it's still CPU bound. Uh, Puget Systems yeah. has a great article basically where they took a whole bunch of configurations and looked at the performance gain from upgrading the GPU from a $300 I want to say GTX uh, 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 1070 all the way up to a Titan, and then they looked at you know amounts of memory, and then they looked at processors, and it's amazing how much money you have to spend on a GPU to get up to like a 20% boost right. in performance. Like right. going from a $300, $399 GPU to a over a thousand dollar GPU gets you like a 20% improvement, but only in certain things. For most of it, throw it at the processor first, the memory second, and then whatever you have left. Like you know, because you can buy a GPU now, and if right. you wait a year, you're going to get the same GPU for a bunch less money, or you're going to get more GPU performance for the same price. I, I actually want to throw in a slightly different list, because, mm -hmm. yeah, processor, because that's going to be your big ticket item, sure. uh, uh, other than the motherboard. Uh, GPU, I would actually put the GPU underneath the SSD. An S a, a oh, proper no. SSD setup on a video editing station... People still buy hard drives? ...is incredible. Well, unfortunately, they do. But, yeah. I mean, if, if you get something like a PCIe-connected card, mm -hmm. or even an M.2 card that does NVMe, yeah. um, if you do a, the, the three SSD setups, nope. so one for operating system, one for assets, and one for render, I, that actually does yeah. move more quickly. And it's not as expensive as buying a really high-end GPU. And, yeah, buy an SSD, please. <laughs> please. If you're using a hard system. drive, then we just... Speak put, a, yeah, put an SSD in your laptop. It change your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patrick, I want to thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure, uh, you know, sir. Any, any chance I get to sit with you and just talk tech, it's a lot of fun. I, I remember... And there was Stu. And I know. Right. See, we're actually going to share Tomahawks. this with our audience. So if any of you want... Uh, yeah, we yeah, let's, do a third let's pass it this way. Answer. Anyone want some Mexican stew? Don't do it. <laughs> And we poisoned our visitors from Australia. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Yes! Uh... <laughs> <laughs> They've also been traveling for the last 24 hours. So. Right, exactly. So anything tastes good to them. <laughs> now, uh, where can people find you? Because you're, you're still active all over the internet. Yeah, no, best place to find me is uh, the show I do with uh, Shannon Morris every week, techthing.com, T-A-K-T-H-I-N-G.com. And then I make a show with Robert Heron, actually a podcast with Robert Heron about home theater and audio and headphones and music and screens and projectors, and that's avxcel at avxcel.com. Oh, always a pleasure. Any chance I get to work with you, I'm, I'm going to jump at it. Dude, it was fun. It was thank fun. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Don't forget that we do this show every Saturday. That's at 3 p.m. Pacific time. You can watch us live at live.twit.tv. As long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. And always you can go to twit.tv slash TNSS. The new screensavers for our show notes, for our back episodes, so you can download all the goodness. And while you're at it, why not subscribe and tell your friends to subscribe so that you won't miss a single moment of tech goodness. Uh, next week is going to be Jason Howell and the other tech guy, the TV tech guy. They're going to be bringing you all the goodness here from the Twit TV studios, the Eastside studios here in Petaluma. Until then, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. I'm Patrick Norton. Good night.